But if you're busy doing something, you go ahead and do it, and we'll skip a whole lot of stuff while you ain't looking. There you go. Okay, we were talking about hell. Let's just go ahead and uh, what, and I don't really need to be covering this in this class, but it's Luke 16. It's a place of departed spirits. Uh, if you want, and you send me your email address, I'd be happy to send you a track that helped me with this tremendously when I first started preaching by uh, Are You Listening? What was his name? Are You Listening? V.E. Howard on Where Are the Dead? Uh, man, that helped me so much as far as when Jesus says, you know, to, to the lady there, she, he says, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father. Well, Jesus is dead. Where has he been? Uh, well, just like he told the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He didn't say you're going to heaven. So he's in the place of called depart of place called Hadean realm, the place of departed spirits, made up of two places, you know, torments and a paradise. And there's a great gulf fixed, and so Luke 16 really helps us out with that. Now, verse 10: When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed. In that day, what a great day that will be. We will glorify the Lord. We will partake of the Lord's glory. We'll experience the fulfillment of our faith. And then we'll enter into our eternal home. Notice uh, Albert Barnes says regarding this, that he is the redeemed in that day will be the means of prompting his glory, promoting his glory. Or the universe will see his glory manifested in their redemption. His chief glory as seen in that day will be connected with the fact that he has redeemed his people. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown says glorified in his saints is the element of the mirror in which his glory will shine brightly. Uh, and then J.W. McGarvey says in that day Jesus will be marveled at and all them that believe because they shall reflect his glory as a mirror gives back the radiance of the sun. I like how we Talk about our glory being changed as we reflect on his verse 13 of, excuse me, verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3. But we all with an open face and unveiled, as uh, that's what the contrast says there with Moses having his face veiled. But we all with an open face unveiled, being able to clearly see, beholding as in a glass, that'd be better if it's a mirror, the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What do we do? We peer into the glory of God. We look at Jesus through the pages of the Bible and as we walk in his example and try to be what he is, we glorify him. Notice verse 11, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness and work of faith with power. Here is Paul, a prayer right here in the middle of this letter, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also, just try to remember as part of our introductory material, this is some of the earliest writings, maybe the earliest writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, the First and Second Thessalonians a letter. They're not set in there historically, okay, uh, like, Starts off with Romans and goes through Philemon and Hebrews is where it is because people like me, I think, think he wrote it too. But we, <laughs> So they put it right in front of the general epistles. But those are not chronologically arranged, okay? So just remember that. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into chapter 2. Woo, the man of sin. That's uh, the sugar stick for so many uh, different folks. Let's break it down into the outline. Christ's second coming, verses 1 through 12. His second coming not yet occurred. <laughs> You'd be, it's amazing you would have to talk about that. And then the events to precede the second coming. Uh, that's really going to help us. And then Thanksgiving and admonition. Okay, let's drive on. Here we go. And again, into 2 Thessalonians, notice, closes it with a prayer, just like he did the, the first chapter. Remember, those chapters are not uh, inspired, separated. Uh, that separation is from men. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's where you get that word perusia. If you uh, ever study any kingism or Max kingism or realized eschatology, he's got a book, you know, and that's one of the names of it. It's the, the idea of the coming, <clears throat> in which he says, 
<coughs> there's not going to be one. It's already taken place. But uh, it literally means near the advent, Christ's coming again. Gathered together is episunagage, same word as in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The assembling there is from the same word, <coughs> gathering together. In case y'all can't tell, I've been having a real fit with my sinuses. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled. Now, why would they be shaken in mind or troubled? Notice, not neither by spirit. In other words, one of these guys who says they have the miraculous gift to preach by the spirit and are not saying the right things. Nor by word. In other words, somebody saying something. Nor by letter as from us. And that leads many to include myself. Thinking that somebody's been out there writing letters saying they're from Paul. when they're not really from him. You ever get any false information? <laughs> Don't you love those phone calls? Hi, my name is Jerry. <laughs> you're like, man, you're not, that ain't even your name. And they want to sell you some car insurance. You don't even have a car. But anyway, uh, somebody's writing false letters. He says, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be shaken. Don't be agitated. Don't get excited. Because here I'm going to tell you about this. Uh, in the Greek literature, it means to move away from like a ship in a moor. Don't let that. Don't let this here move you from the truth. Don't listen to what these fellows are having to say. Troubled idea, frightened, neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter. Three things there. Three different ways people were trying to agitate the Thessalonian Christians. Isn't it amazing how much effort? Uh, People that don't believe or are trying to uh, draw disciples after themselves, how much effort they will put in to teaching falsehoods. It, it's just, what's that? Oh, I, yeah. And, you know, organized. Uh, it's what amazes me. Notice the NIV, the RSV, and the NASB all says, um, all, I translate this, has already come. Uh, and so, you know, that's their idea on that. And good reason. Uh, for doing so in most occurrences this word is translated the sense of already present having taken place and so Paul affirmed that the second coming was indeed near uh, therefore saying it was near would not constitute a false doctrine and of course it's nearer today than it was yesterday right teaching that the resurrection was already past was mentioned in other places remember it was condemned 2 Timothy 2 at verse 17 he says these people are teaching this that the resurrection's already passed. And, of course, that was condemned there. And that's exactly uh, the king, uh, the realized eschatology. That's, that's what they say. And, brethren, that's a, that's a thing. Uh, I, I don't think it's a big thing around here right now. But it's, it's pretty big in, in some places in Ohio and in Michigan. Um, and it's even made its way overseas uh, to some of the uh, uh, Asian countries. Where, you know, and the church is small anyway. And then you get some yahoos saying that this is already taking place. Why is that popular? It's popular because it ties up in a, in a box, in a cute little bow you can put on it and say, okay, it's done. Everything you read about, prophetical, and the Bible has already been accomplished. There's no resurrection. There's going to be no uh, second coming. And, of course, it's just false. What is 1 Corinthians 15 talking about? A bodily resurrection. And... uh Anyway, let no man deceive you. We already said that. Uh, and notice, uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a following away first. The first letter he wrote and says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about the second coming of our Lord, concerning those who are already asleep. Well, apparently they're still concerned about it, not so much about those who have uh, died now that he's kind of cleared that up, but they don't understand that it's not going to be this afternoon that the Lord is coming back. Because you're going to find that some of them already quit their jobs. They just are ready just to, man, we're just sitting around kind of waiting, you know, for the Lord to come back. And he's going to tell them, look, there's going to be some things that have to take place first. And so he enumerates some of those and says, except there come a following away first. Now, that's not the first time he's talked about following ways, right? Acts 20, verse 28 he had the elders of Ephesus meet him at the Isle of Miletus. And one of the things he did was warn them that from their own selves would men arise to draw disciples away from themselves. 
In the letters to Timothy, he said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, you know, and telling you not to eat meat and so forth, or being married and so forth. And so he's talked about the falling away on, on, on many occasions, and he says that has to take place first. Now there's some additional information that is not listed in other places. And that, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now you've got some notes there, and I've, gave you, I've given you a ton of material on this particular chapter, reason being, uh, it's one of the most difficult and it's one of the most uh, controversial, and those that brethren, you know, even kind of disagree on in some places. And I can't say for sure that, w that what I believe is right on that, but I think it fits the, the criteria that we're given here better than any other that I can think of. And maybe you have some, you could help me out with that. But it says, in the man of lawlessness, that's how some of the other translations, uh, the ESV, the New American Standard Bible, and NIV, the man of sin be revealed. They call him the man of lawlessness, which is what sin is, right? What is sin? It's transgression of the law, right? Or, or lawless, to miss the mark, the son of destruction. I think it's kind of interesting the uh, son of perdition, the only other person in Scripture you'll find that that's used about is who? Trivial pursuit. Who's that? Somebody got it. All right. Can you buy a vow? Here we go. Uh, oh, I had it in those notes. You cheated, Carlin. <laughs> Notice the man of sin has been everything, and you've got a lot of these. This is stuff. This is different. Uh, if you see something extra, go ahead and write it down. But he's been called uh, the Antichrist. Now, the tough thing about that is the Antichrist is not mentioned in this book. In fact, the only guy that talks about him is John. And it's always a small letter. It's not ever capitalized. And New King James really, in my opinion, dropped the ball on that when they uh, capitalized that because that, people are looking for a Antichrist. They're looking for the Antichrist. When I was in the Baptist church years ago, it was Henry Kissinger. Of all the people, you know. Uh, Saddam Hussein, I get that. But Henry Kissinger, he's never been somebody so soft-spoken. But anyway... Antichrist, we're in John's day. There today, anybody, who's an Antichrist? Whoever denies that Jesus came in the flesh. And so there's bukus of them. There always has been. And if you don't even believe in Jesus, then you're an Antichrist. You know, bottom line is, you certainly don't believe he came in the flesh. You don't believe in him at all. And But people want this one rule, one world rule order that they can try to kind of fit you know, the round things into the square holes of revelations to try to make uh, the idea of the rapture and the Armageddon and all of that. Uh, and the bottom line is that's not so. It's just not so. But anyway, I always referred to as Antichrist. It's Antichrist. Uh, notice number two, he's been an abomination of desolation. That is so not right. But anyway, what is the abomination of desolation? As spoken of by Daniel. Do you remember? Luke tells us. When you see the armies. That have circled. That's the abomination of the desolation. That's when the Romans. Are in a place they're not supposed to be. Which is in Jerusalem. That's the abomination of desolation. The beast from the sea. From Revelations 11 and 7. and Excuse me. 11 and 13. The beast from the earth. Revelations 13. The false prophet. Revelation 16. The great harlot. Revelation 17, Belial of Deuteronomy 13, 13, the great red dragon, the little horn of Daniel's fourth beast, little horn of Daniel's he goat, the destroying prince of Daniel 9, the willful king of Daniel 11. He's been just about everybody. Most people today believe in this as talking about a future world ruler. And Albert Barnes, who's excellent commentary uh, on, uh, I believe he was a Methodist, but you know, he's very a very very long uh, he's been dead probably a century and uh, his stuff's good stuff but he's kind of throwed that out there first and everybody's kind of run with it to try to explain some things they don't understand in the book of revelation listen i don't understand everything there is to understand about some of the prophecies of isaiah or daniel or, or revelation or zechariah that apocryphal stuff where it's you know you're looking at pictures there, uh, it's it's like a, a movie. It's like looking at photos, 
uh, you know, symbols and so forth. There's a lot of things I don't understand, but I know one thing, that I can't take something that's highly symbolic and make it contradict things that are very clear. And we've already seen how the second coming is going to take place, and Jesus has already said what? No man knoweth. You know, there's not going to be all these signs of Matthew 24 because those, math, those signs of Matthew 24 up to verse 33 are talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he switches and says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, talking about the second coming, and it's going to be just like in the days of Noah. Nobody knew. They're going to be given in marriage, and you know, they're going to be having parties and so forth. Just an average day when the Lord returns. And yet, they spend all their time trying to figure out who this Antichrist guy is going to be. I believe, personally, and you might be saying, oh, you can't do any better than that. It's what I think. That it's talking about the Roman Catholic papacy. I believe that's who fits this better than any other. There's a fellow by the name of Gary Workman. He helped me a lot in the book of Revelation. I called him one time as I first started preaching. The first book that I tried to teach as a full-time preacher was the book of Revelation. That was one of the worst decisions I ever made in my life. But I also, but I, I tell you, I learned some things. And that is, I need to spend a whole lot more time in Ezekiel and a whole lot more time in Zechariah. And I needed to learn a lot more about apocalyptic literature. You know, stuff that's uh, pictures and symbols and so forth. But anyway, it says from, this is a quote from him. From the, this is from the Denton Lectures on 1 and 2 Thessalonians. From the time of the Protestant Reformation, the view pro proliferated that the man of sin was not a single individual, but a succession of men, the popes, and that the restraining power was the Roman Empire, out of whose ruin, ruins the papacy arose. Uh, they were the restraining influence. They were the ones that were keeping back the Roman church from doing anything it wanted to do. Martin Luther, John Calvin. As a matter of fact, John Calvin... I just had to read the first three volumes of his four-volume work on the Institute's Christianity. And man, was it a labor of love. Also, they forced me. But anyway, but he quotes over and over again a fellow by the name of Augustine. Of course, his name's, we're supposed to, I think we say it wrong. It's supposed to be Augustine. But anyway, uh, I go to St. Augustine, so I'm going to keep calling him Augustine, all right? Uh, he was a fourth-century writer that Catholics loved. And they quote him a lot. So Calvin would use Augustine to attack. And he would quote Augustine to try to prove Catholic doctrine was wrong. Why? Martin Luther, John Calvin, these guys are fighting the Roman Catholics. They've lost family members too. They've seen the, the terrible things that the Catholics have just come up with. The way they were killing people. The way that they were running countries. And just basically destroying men's lives. And, and it was just. So anyway. These two individuals. We know them as the great Protestant ref reformers. And others held the position that the man of sin was the Pope. And incorporated them into their creedal statements. You had another fellow by the name of Ul Ulrich Swingley. Who was in Geneva. Uh, and he was fighting against. And I mean literally. He died in combat fighting against the Catholic Church uh, in, in his country. Notice the Westminster Confession of pay, Faith in 1646 stated that the Pope of Rome is that Antichrist, that man of sin, the son of perdition that exalted himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. The King James translators wrote concerning their work, the Bible that I have and used even to this day Quote, by writing in defense of the truth, and then the parenthetical statement, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. In other words, they were saying, we're putting this out there to the public. Now everybody that can read English and speak English can know the truth. Because what were the Romans doing with it? You go to a Roman church, maybe now it's different. But, you know, for the first 1,500 years, you better know Latin or you don't, hear, you don't know a single thing that's going on. You just simply do what they instruct you. You didn't know the Scriptures. They don't study the Scriptures. What do Catholics study? What do they call that? Catechism. What is that? This is our rules, man. <laughs> this is our rules. You've got to know them 
They don't wor- they're not worried about the Bible. There's too many things in the Bible that would cause people to stop and go, now wait a minute, this forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats that God has given for every man to enjoy as long as it's been done with Thanksgiving? How come we got to do that? You know, people would ask questions, wouldn't they? This view prevailed until the middle of the 17th century when men started to look elsewhere for this man of sin. Why do you think men started to look elsewhere about the 17th century? What's happened in the last three or 400 years? What's that, brother? Well, yeah, they could read. Yeah, that's true. But is, uh, is Catholicism considered a great evil today? It's cool to be Catholic now, ain't it? I mean, it really is. You go to YouTube, man, you see all the dudes with their collars turned backwards and they're hip and stuff. Young guys, comb, got lots of hair and stuff. I mean, it's great. It's cool to be Catholic. They're no longer what people used to think of Catholics. And that is gathering up all the non-Catholics and killing them, you know. There's a, y'all, are y'all familiar with St. Augustine? There's a bay out there. Uh, I was trying to think of the name of it. Oh, man, I've only been to it a million times. Well, anyway, it got its name because the fort up in Jacksonville was needing to surrender. They were French or British, I think it was French, Protestants. And they needed, man, they didn't have nothing to eat. Times was hard. Their supply ships hadn't come. So they came down to St. Augustine because the Spanish had just gotten there, fresh supplies, fresh food and all that stuff, and wanted to surrender. And they could, as long as they confessed that they were wrong and the Catholic Church was right. And over 160 of them had their throats slit and thrown over the side of the ship that they were on, Matanza. Matanza is the name of it. But you don't read that when you go down there. That's not something that we talk a whole lot about. And that is, I mean, either you, you denounce Protestantism, in other words, you know, that the Pope is not the king, you know, Pope's the, the head man. You say that, or we cut your throat and throw you over the edge. I remember one time uh, seeing the Catholics, they were, it was an old history book I had, and they were killing the Seminoles. They were uh, slitting their throats. And I thought to myself, if I'd been a Seminole, and I saw that dude in front of me go down in the water, and they'd said, you believe that, you know, in Catholicism or whatever. And he said no, and they slit his throat. I got a good idea what I'm probably saying when I get in there. You know, yeah, man, whatever, you know, leave me alone. I'm a pagan anyway. But uh, I just, there, there was great wars, lots of death, a lot of killing, and I think we've forgotten that. Notice the falling away, not one of many, but a great general sweeping apostasy distinguished from all others. I think, uh, you know, now the Spirit expects, we just quoted this a moment ago, you know, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. Uh, what's going to happen? They will not endure sound doctrine in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. And they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned into fables. And why is that? Because they don't love the truth, as we'll see here in a moment. Who opposeth, it, if, now we're back, Second Thessalonians 2, talking about the things that are going to take place, place the man of sin, the uh, son of perdition. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. You ever seen Christmas Mass on television? You, if you never get a chance to watch it, you need to watch it at least once. It's a tremendous dog and pony show. I mean, it's the, everything is out. When you go into a Catholic cathedral, when I was, I was in a place called Bamberg, Germany. I was stationed there for about two and a half years. Bamberg is uh, known because it's one of the few places the Allies didn't bomb during World War II because it's on seven hills. The only pope at that time buried outside of Rome was buried in Bamberg. So we didn't blow it up. And so those Catholic, those big cathedrals are still there. And when you walk into them, it is made, it's designed to put you in awe. To give you uh, the realization, you know, or to, to make you think that you're in something greater and larger than yourself. And just as they would say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Just kind of like these little idols we have everywhere. You're not really praying to the idol. You're just putting, getting you in the mindset for it. It's not what, <laughs> you know, the whole idea of New Testament Christianity is about putting away fleshly things. It's not being in, in this mind uh, you know, have music and idols and everywhere, just all these sensory things. It's about inner, uh, inner man. It's talking about the spirit that dwells within us. That's, we worship today in spirit and in truth, not in all of this. And so, 
when you think of, if you see that Christmas mass, you kind of get an idea of in who sits in the middle, who's upon the throne, uh, all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Peter 2, you think about false teachers, Jude one seventeen. Uh, Jude 1.18, we'll just get through this real quick. Notice some of the things. The apostasy that produced the Roman Catholic Church is the greatest falling away that has been seen in the Christian age. You think of the monarchical bishops, those that not only were they the, the local religious person, but they were also in charge of the country, uh, in, in charge of the town or wherever they were. Infant baptism, heathen rituals in worship. Uh, what do we mean by that? You know, uh, uh, All Saints Day, we call it Halloween today. The Catholic Church has always rolled with it. And when, you know, they had all these pagans who were used to these female deities, what did they come up with? They gave them one. Uh, you know, now Mary is a, a, a god, if you will. The, the state religion, in other words, they ran the country, if you will. Mary declared the mother of God. Forgiveness of sins by a priest, imagine that. Corruption of the Lord's Supper into the sacrificial uh, sacrifice of the Mass. Transubstantiation, where they say the bread becomes the actual body of Christ, the actual blood of Christ. Indulgences, where you could buy sins to help pay for St. Peter's Cathedral, basically. The worship of images, they don't have any problem with that whatsoever. Came up with purgatory, got to have a place for those babies. Single communion, enforced celibacy. Uh, immaculate conception. You know what immaculate conception is? I always thought it was Jesus. It's not. It's Mary. See, uh, in order for her to uh, have Jesus and Jesus to be sinless, uh, because you inherit sin, is what they teach, they needed to clean Mary up. Well, immaculate conception is that. One of the two times that the Pope sat ex cathedra and said, when he does that, whatever comes out of his mouth is supposed to be just as it is the Word of God. And he pronounced that Mary had been born without sin, so you have the immaculate conception. You have the infallibility of the Pope, which is a joke, because you can go back and you can read where these popes were making mistakes left and right. It's, it's commonly known, uh, and yet yeah. bodily assumption of Mary. We had to get her off the earth. We had to get her out here, so people, uh, amazing. Well, remember ye not, Paul, this is things he'd already gone over with them, that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, there's a restraining element there. And I believe the only thing that fits that is when the Roman government continued to exist and was holding them back because once Rome was destroyed as far as the government, then they pretty much did as they pleased. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So whatever was happening that was going to, uh, part of these things that was happening, Paul is saying it's already begun. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So until when the Roman government is taken out of the way, you know, the emperors and so forth, then you're going to have the holy emperors. And they're going to be able to do whatever they want. The reason I think the Roman Catholic Church fits this scenario better than any other is that it had already begun. The apostasy had already begun in the first century. Uh, you're going to have the diatrophies. Uh, John, who liked to have the preeminence among men, that's going to be something that's you're going to have single bishop a rule until they start getting together like the Council of Nicaea in 325. And then by the time we get to the 6th century, they're going to start having popes. And so that's something that was going on in the 1st century that's continued to go on and is even going on today because here's the kicker. Whatever was going on then is still going to be going on when Jesus comes back. Yes, sir, it's got to be, yes, ma'am, it has to be happening today. Uh-huh. And it, it's great that you brought that up because that's exactly right. It's going on today and it must be going on today. Because it's going to go on until Jesus comes back. Because Jesus is going to deal with this when, when he comes back. Notice, and when that, and then shall that wicked, notice the King James translates that with a capital W because they're thinking that particular one, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth 
and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You know, brethren, I know that we've said this, used it in sermons, and I think rightfully so. There's going to be so many surprises on Judgment Day. You know, uh, and I think that's absolutely correct. But can you imagine being in the College of the Cardinals or being uh, the next, the newest? I mean, if you really think that that's right, that, that's going to be a major surprise, is it not? Because Jesus ain't going to be kissing no rings that day. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Isn't it amazing? You think about all the backroom deals that were done with kings and queens and marriages that were made and marriages that were annulled uh, just because the Pope said so. Remember the whole deal with Henry VIII wanting to, uh, you know, obviously Henry VIII was scumbag. But, I mean, that's the reason they pulled out of the Catholic Church so he could have some more marriages because the Pope had to say who you could marry and who you couldn't. Uh, amazing. And with all deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, brethren, I tell you, that's something right there. If you, don't, if you mark your Bibles, that's got mine marked there. Some people don't love the truth. And that is a very much a character flaw for a Christian. You've got to love the truth beyond your life. You've got to love the truth above all else because it's all that matters. And you have some people who like righteousness, so to speak. They like trying to do good as long as it fits their agenda. But when it comes to the, the hard rubber road, hard road or the brass tacks of it, when uh, what's truth? Uh, they don't want to hear it. They've got their own ideas, and just like the Jews of old, they've went about to establish their own righteousness. And for this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. It's easy to be a Catholic today. When you go and you see a Catholic parish, just about every place that you can think of, you see the enormity, you see the wealth, you see the power that has been used and how old it is. My sister, my half-sister had a brother, and he uh, got sick and started looking for the, and I found all this out post-mortem. But I'd imagine as a young person, he probably just thought, well, what's the oldest? You know, he was trying to find, you know, who's been around the longest? You know, you got all these churches and everything. Who's been around the longest? And that's, I guess, how he got caught up in Catholicism. He didn't love the truth that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The traits of the man of sin, let's think about it. He's the ultimate result of the falling away. He has yet to be revealed in the first century. He opposes God and exalts himself. In some sense, he will sit in the temple of God. He deceives those who love not the truth by lying wonders or pretended miracles. You know, you've got to have two confirmed miracles to be what? To be a saint, you won't be a saint, man. You've got to have two miracles, man. Used to, you had to be dead 100 years, but if you're popular enough, they can wave that one. Uh, that, that's some mm, mm. miracles. Statues crying, bed sheets with pictures on them. You've heard them all. Early stages were already at work, verse 7. Number 7, in Paul's day, there was a restraining influence. I believe that to be the Roman emperors before they became the holy Roman emperors. emperors. Having roots in early Christianity, he would nevertheless endure in some way till the second coming. I believe that's sticking with it. Notice this. After imperial Rome fell, the apostate church of the day accelerated in its power. As mentioned earlier, great political authority was gained. Crowns were removed and bestowed at the behest of papal rulers. For example, in the 11th century, in the Christian era, Emperor Henry IV sought to depose Pope Gregory known as Hildebrand. In retaliation, Gregory excommunicated the emperor and absolved all subjects from allegiance to him, said his own kingdom didn't have to obey him. He was powerless, and he had to go stand outside for three days at this guy's house, uh, barefoot in the snow, awaiting an audience with the pontiff so that he could be blessed and given his kingdom back. Wayne Jackson wrote that up. Notice other examples of the growing power of the papal authority are numerous. In Germany, Emperor Frederick lay down on the floor and allowed Pope Alexander to stand on his neck. Imagine the audacity 
of a man saying, you know, King, you're going to lay down here and I'm going to put my boot on your throat just to show how absolutely amazing. Uh, that was from Jackson as well. Uh, absolutely. It's not the popular view today. Uh, Kaufman has a, a large quote about that where I think it's because, and I think the reason is it's cool to be a Catholic now. A lot of people, you know, you should have seen the faces or on the bull boat tour, the guys talking about this is where they slew 166 people and threw them overboard and people like, you know, you don't read about that very often today. But uh, indeed it was the case. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. This goes fits right in line with uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, predestination for the nation that the group of people uh, that obey the gospel. It says, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Stand fast. You know, you're fighting against this. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Another prayer. Closes out each chapter. Uh, notice with, with a, 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 a short Prayer. prayer expository preaching we'll talk about this very briefly I know you're tired I'm tired but this is verse by verse that's what expo ex expository means and it's a good thing why because a lot of times people wouldn't talk about uh, you know withdrawing a fellowship and so forth it's not something we want to preach on a whole lot it's not a popular topic and you get people upset at you uh, Reggie what did you what, verse 15 of chapter 2 what did it say what did you want to The traditions, is there anything wrong with traditions? No, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with traditions as long as you're right, traditions, right? Uh, I mean, you got to have worship service first and Oh, I hope not, because we'll have to repent at Trenton. We're, uh, we have Bible study for... No, I think, I think the traditions he's talking about there, uh, well... Let's just read that. What's the context of it? Before he says, Whereunto he called you by our, our, our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. I think traditions there. Let me make sure. Let's see what kind of word that is. Make sure it's not something more. Paradosis, a handing down, a tradition, a precept, specifically uh, uh, traditionally in, or in Jewish, uh, of a law, an ordinance, or a transition. And I believe that's how he's using the word there. Obviously, Paul wouldn't tell you to do something that wasn't right. So he's saying, you know, be faithful and stand fast and hold traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So whether we said it to you, or we've wrote it to you, written it to you, wrote it to you, we wrote it to you, uh, unless we've written it to you, you know, uh, obey this. I don't think there's any way that he's saying that you're going to elevate these traditions. Because we use that word tradition, we're talking about, well, you know, how do we use that word tradition? Uh, yeah, yeah, and so, and what they practice, right? Yeah. When you, we talk about the Bible and how it authorizes, how does the Bible authorize? Direct command. How else? What's that? Necessary inference. That's right. Or a uh, or an example, right? And so uh, when we say upon the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread, Acts 20 verse 7, what are they doing? Taking the Lord's Supper. Nobody says anything bad about it, right? It's what the apostles were practicing. Fits right in line with 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. On the first day of the week, they're laying by in the store. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, you know, on the first day of the week when you come together, you should be taking the Lord's Supper, but you're not. So we can derive from those, those kind of principles that, uh, you know, here's an example of the apostles. And so we can, from that, say this, the Bible's authorized us to do this. This is how it should be done. We don't have an example of them doing it quarterly or on Easter. What you got, sister? Well, 
Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree. I think that's I think that's exactly right. Yes. Yes. I agree. I think that I think y'all guys are all over it. Uh, we can be. We need to be careful because sometimes we can think that certain things aren't possible. I mean, you know, uh, it was suggested that maybe we could take the Lord's Supper last. You know, and uh, people are like, Fool, no, we ain't gonna do that. <laughs> we, we take it first. Oh, okay, all right. I told him, well, where I we used to, sister back here goes to Mountain View. I used to go to Mountain View, and we moved the Lord's Supper from the beginning of services to the end. And the reason it was done is so the guys who were playing softball wouldn't get up and leave halfway through service. Because, I mean, they were on the church softball team, which some of us weren't too crazy about anyway. And then they would leave early. You know, they'd take the, got to get the Lord's Supper in because that's how sins are forgiven, right? You know, see, there's another thing where I think Catholic influence has hurt us because that's one of the ways you're saved in the Catholic Church is by taking a sacrament, which, of course, is the Lord's Supper. Oh, you need to come to Trenton. Sometimes we have about five minutes left for sermon. I mean, boy, we, we do the... Yeah, you need to. Uh, yeah, we've got... Uh, yeah, sometimes we've got to be careful that we're not... Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Right. Buddy, I tell you what, they, uh, I, I climb in the pulpit sometimes going like, I got 15 minutes. This ain't never going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, uh, expository, and Reggie, thanks for, yeah, I'm glad we remembered. I hope that you good with that. Okay. Uh, verse by verse, good things happen because we have to talk about things we might not normally want to, the difficult things and some things we wouldn't want to deal with at all. Now we're going to be talking about withdrawing from uh, idlers, I-D-L-E-E-R-S. Calm assurance, verses 1 through 5, disorderliness, condemned. God is not the author of confusion, right? So you can be sure he'd be unhappy with uh, things being done disorderly. Then, of course, the benediction or final prayer. Amazing. A fact that some deny obedience as necessary to being a Christian. Isn't it incredible? In order to become a Christian, obedience is absolutely necessary. Why call you me Lord, Lord? Do not things which I say. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. But he that doeth the will, right? In order to be a faithful Christian, obedience is absolutely necessary. And I need to go on through this. Let's get to the text itself. Uh, if I had more time. I, I do want to talk. Obedience. This is a true story. There's a friend of mine. I could tell you his name, but then I'd give away the congregation. Of course, y'all wouldn't know it. It's a long way from here. But he's a friend of mine, and he was he announced that he was going to preach on withdrawing fellowship that night. And he said, I want to tell you something. We're going to name some names. Well, he was talking about the type of people that should be drawn, withdrawn from. So, But he didn't say that. He just said, we're going to name some names. After services, there was... A lady came up to him, one of the members had a big family there, and she said, if you'll just let us leave and not say anything, we promise we won't bother you anymore. <laughs> and so you talk, about, you talk about throwing a rock in the middle of the... And, and he was going like, that, that's not what I was talking about. But, and he said, you know, that family had been difficult, and obviously she knew it as well. I just thought that was so hilarious. People who need to be withdrawn from, we're going to name names. Yeah, you better be careful. Folks won't show up with it. Uh, let's begin with verse 6. Now we command you, why in the world would I do that? I skipped the first three. We're going to have to do that straight out of Scripture. Let's look at that real quick. Uh, tell you what I've done with this. Uh, some of these, 
I have preached, I've made sermons out of a couple of the verses. That's, I know that's what happened here, that I, I preached it differently. In that, I took a three-point sermon out of the first, uh, first uh, six. You know, and that's something, brethren. Next time I do this, if y'all want to wait 20 years, take it again. Uh, I've got a bunch of sermons on individual texts that I would like to have shared with you, but did not. You might say, well, great, you know, thanks for nothing. Uh, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. In other words, nothing hindrances. No hindrances. Think about God. Think about Paul and his prayer life. And he's asking for the prayers of these, of these folks. He says that it may be glorified even as it is with you. In other words, people would appreciate it like you've appreciated it. None, one of your memory verses this quarter has been the you accepted it as it is in truth, the word of God. And that's what he's wanting them to pray for verse 2 and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith no doubt about that here you've got these false teachers who are troubling the people there in Thessalonica by word or spirit or by letter uh, giving a hard time and they've of course given Paul he's been chased all around Europe by fellas that uh, but verse 3 but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil and notice on your notes there, the, uh, the ASV and some of the newer translations translate that evil one. The ASV keeps one in italics because it's an addition to it. But they believe that's talking about Satan, the one, you know. And verse 4, and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. There's that idea of obedience. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ that's what they're supposed to be doing patient waiting they've been being patient so forth he's praised them earlier in this book and now let's get back here to verse 6 that makes a little bit more sense uh, okay here we go now we commend you brethren in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly it's command it's imperative this is not me and you brethren just can't say well, we just we're probably just not going to do that. You know, that's, that's kind of tough. Let's not do that. No, it's a command. And it's by the authority of or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not only his apostolic, apostolic authority, but he intensifies it with the authority of Christ that you would draw yourself to diminish, to pull in the sails, if you will. Walketh disorderly. This is a military term, means out of step, ranks. Somebody's on the left foot and they're supposed to be on the right. Somebody is not walking. <coughs> like they should we talk about the Christian walk that means that there's a walk that's not Christian and we need to make sure that that's not the walk that we're doing it says for yourselves know how you ought to follow us for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you you know Paul would tell the Corinthians you follow us as we follow Christ and that's what he's saying here same thing with the traditions a while ago you know we've been behaving ourselves we've been giving you an example <coughs> how you ought to follow us for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you same ver word as in verse 6 how that's what not to do and he says we weren't behaving like that around you we showed you how you ought. neither did we eat any man's bread for naught your notes has the idea there this is an idiom it has the idea of uh, you know you got to your work for it you're paying for it uh, we didn't just take people's stuff and but he did he had a right to do that but notice he says but wrought with labor travail night and day that we wouldn't be a burden we wouldn't be chargeable to any of you this is a semitism uh, and that just means it's an idiom it's a <coughs> the language it's like you know I'd get my right arm for that car or something you wouldn't really do that it's like a figure of speech it means to make one's living we didn't we weren't taking advantage of anybody uh, Robertson's word picture says it's a Hebraism, a Jewish uh, idiom, to eat, make one's own living. Verse 9, not because we have not power. Paul had, had a right to be supported. <coughs> he had a right, you know, you don't muzzle the uh, ox that treadeth the corn. He had a right to get paid. A laborer is worthy of his rewards, but he didn't exercise that as an ensemble to them to work hard to give them this example and I guess this is one of the reasons he's appealing to this is like look when we were with you we had that we could have just sat around you know and you could have supported us but he said we didn't do that we gave you an example of how you need to work with your hands and here you are you're not doing that and so he's appealing to that example there's that same word uh, pattern to pause that 
that uh, form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, that's a word that's just always stuck in my mind. I hope I can stick it in your mind. I hope you can put it in there. Tupas, that you have obeyed from the heart, that form, that tupas, that pattern of work. And that's so important because in Romans 6, 17, he's talking about, remember what he just finished in Romans 6, 1 through 4? That you were baptized, that you, you know, uh, put the old man to death, you raised to walk in newness of life. And then in verse 17, he says that was a pattern. That was, you, you knew to do that. Here is the same word, it's translated ensemble. He says, we made ourselves an ensemble to you to follow us. An example, a pattern. For even when we were with you, this we commanded that if any would not work, neither should he eat. We commanded, it's imperative. You know, this is not a gray area. Don't do this. And this is a Jewish, based on a Jewish proverb of Genesis 3 at verse 19. Do you remember what that was talking about? By the sweat of your brow, how was you going to, you're going to have to work. You know, ground got cursed. And now, can you imagine? I like to plant flowers and stuff like that. I gave up on gardening a long time ago. I killed so many different plants. It just wasn't good. But I try to have a flower or two, you know. But can you imagine soil that would work with you? You know, that would be good, that wouldn't have thorns and thistles and I mean that just I might be able to pull that off uh, but that, that's the idea sweat of your brow you're going to work for it chapter 4 verse 11 of the first letter study to be quiet do your own business to work with your own hands as we commanded you for we hear that there are some which walk orderly or disorderly among you that's that same idea there they're busy bodies they toil about meddling I put the little Greek word in there actually it's about that long uh, and you, you'll see that it's you're just picking around in other people's business. If you're, you know, some of the crime problems we're having in Chattanooga, we wouldn't have if young people were out there with jobs, working, going somewhere and doing something constructive for eight, ten hours a day, whatever. Uh, you know, having to get up in the mornings, go to work, come home. You're tired. You don't feel like driving by and shooting people. You know, uh, but until we get that through people's heads that if you can encourage people to work by not feeding them you know after three or four days you're you're about ready to do anything and man a can of ravioli looks just as good as a filet mignon i mean uh one of the things we do is a dessert i don't need to jump on this i ain't got time but we do a disservice to our young people we do a disservice to our fellow countrymen when we just hand them things to eat because uh, you'll just sit around and eat. And then you just, you know, it's just not good. Toil about meddling in other man's things. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. Command, apostolic command, imperative. And per we encourage, exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. You know, for somebody like me, you got to study to be quiet, right? You got to work on it. It's not in our nature. We need to stay out of other people's business and make our own way. And in doing so, we'll have extra left over and we can help other folks who don't have, right? Opposite conduct of what was expressed in verse 11, where they're busybodies. Want to be quiet, work out your own uh, stuff. Verse 13, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Have you heard that before? Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Oh yeah, one of my favorites. Uh, verse 14, if, anybody, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, hang a, man, hang a note on him. I love what Robertson has here. Uh, did I not put it in here? Here we go. Put a tag on that man. That's the idea. You mark that man. You let folks know this fella ain't doing what he's supposed to do and have no company with him. What's that tell us? Our company's important, but it's not important to somebody who it's not important to. What do I mean by that? You can't withdraw a fellowship. You can't mark somebody or not have company with people you don't already not have company with. You know, it's got to mean something. And that's why relationships in the church need to be a lot stronger, I'm afraid, than sometimes they are. To a distinguished mark, put a tag on that fella. Have no company with him. Company, boy, there's that big old thing. To mix up together, don't be with him. That he may be what? Ashamed. There's nothing wrong with shame. Shame, if you need to be ashamed, it's a good thing because it's your conscience. It's pricking you. It's telling you, hey, look, you need to do something. This is not good. And so it's not bad to be, to be ashamed. And notice, brethren, that this is uh, different 
And notice uh, Robertson Word Picture says the idea is to have one's thoughts turned in on oneself. In other words, I need to think about what I'm doing. If I'm ashamed, then I need, okay, what, what's wrong with that? I need to fix it. Yet count him not as an enemy. Think of him as the idea of count an enemy, someone to be hated. We have to be careful. We treat brethren differently than we do people in the world. If somebody in the world's out there sinning, what do you do? <laughs> That's what the world does. I mean, you can go out and eat with them. You know, you're going to eat with them. If you go to the restaurant somewhere, you're in the world, you, it's okay. But if you've got a brother that's walking disorderly, well, that's different. You're not to be with them. You're not to eat with them. That's hard. Notice, uh, and you can't count him as an enemy. Now, it's not somebody you want to beat up, you know, or give him a noogie to get him in a headlock, right? Someone to be hated in adversary. No, you, but admonish him. Put him in mind. You're trying to, the whole idea of withdrawal fellowship is to encourage one. To come back home. To do what's right. Private admonitions are sometimes necessary. Jesus says if you have an all against a brother. You go to that brother. If he won't listen to you. Then sometimes this can become a church problem. If you take one or two with you. And he won't listen to you. Then you're to make it known to the church. But be remember that you can convert an erring brother. From the error of his ways. And save a soul from death. James 5, 19 and 20. Brother overtaken in the fault needs to be restored, Galatians 6, verse 1. The heretic must be admonished once or twice, Titus 3, 10, 11. And the final effort to get one to repent is the withdrawal of fellowship. It's not first. It's after you've done everything else you can. The one from whom fellowship was drawn is to be admonished as a brother. Commands from the Lord, the Lord exercised that. You remember what happened to a couple of folks in Acts chapter 5? Lied unto the Spirit. Now the church didn't exercise discipline. The Spirit did. Cost a couple of people their lives. You remember that? The church must be kept pure. Uh, remember Paul said he wanted to present her as a chaste virgin. The church is like a ship. The world would represent the water. Water on outside the ship's okay. But when it gets inside the ship, it can cause it to sink. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand. I put a note in there about an amunusence or however you say that. Uh, somebody writing a letter for you, a secretary if you will. Make note of that. But notice he says, the salutation with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And then last but not least, what is the theme of this book and the one that preceded it? Jesus is coming back. Amen. Boy, I appreciate your attention. You've been great. Uh, sorry, I'm... Uh, well, I thought we'd be done for now, just to be honest with you. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. You, you guys make this worthwhile. I hope you get something from it. If you have any questions or anything, you've got my name and information and stuff on the, the thing there in the beginning. What was that, the syllabus? And you, you text me, email me, whatever you need. Uh, be Do anything for you, I can. Any questions or anything before we shut her down? Whew. It's been a run, ain't it? It's been the longest 13 weeks I believe I can remember. Hadn't it been like 19 weeks or something? <laughs> hey, Josh, would you close us with a prayer? Amen. Thank you. I'm about to steal Peter's mic here. He'll be chasing me down. Thank you, Ron.